Good morning, FPC family. We are so glad to see you. Could you please stand and let's praise our God together this morning. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. With all of my heart, all of my strength, with all that I have, I will sing that everything. about that song is um, it invites us to, to be a little bit crazy 
and, and only some of you are good at that. Like, like only some of, some of you are really excited about singing and, and joining with all of creation. Or maybe you're excited, but you're just like, you know what, I'm more of a quiet excited. I get that. Wherever you're at today, we're glad that you are worshiping with us this morning here at FPC Lakeland in our Vine service. And if today is your first Sunday or one of your first Sundays, we, 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 we really want to welcome you. And, and so after the service is over, uh, we've got a table in the back, some folks that want to greet you and and give you a gift and invite you to, to meet some of the leaders here after the service is over. Um, if you're a first time guest, we want to, to help you connect uh, with what God is doing here at FPC and to connect in a way that you can grow in your faith in Jesus Christ because God has is, is blessed us um, as a congregation in extraordinary ways. We have a lot of wonderful uh, programs and ministries where you can deepen your faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to highlight one of those uh, programs in just a moment, but um, I want you to know that our mission as a congregation is to make and mature disciples for Jesus Christ. We want to help you be on a journey to, 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 to follow Jesus in a powerful way, in an eternal way, in a way that affects how you, you think, how you, how, you, how you relate to other people, how you look at your finances uh, so that it's not just a temporal impact, an impact that just affects here and now, but affects all throughout eternity. And if you are part of our congregation regularly, we want to invite you to partner in that mission to make mature disciples by one, getting involved, getting involved in groups, getting involved in service projects, getting involved in things like Kids Pack, where they had a, a wonderful program today where they packed hundreds and hundreds of meals for kids all over our community, um, getting involved with our children's ministry, our, our ministry to special needs folks. Um, get involved and partner in that way for your own discipleship journey and for the discipleship journey of others. And you can partner financially. And uh, part of our worship service every single week is to, to put out that call. And again, if you're a new person, if this is your first Sunday, no, no, absolutely no pressure to, to, to participate in this way. But if you are part of this community, as, as Jennifer kicks us off every week, if you're part of the FPC family, uh, we invite you to uh, be, be a, an active participant in, in expanding the kingdom of God uh, through our programs by contributing financially. And there are a lot of ways you can give. We can, you can give here in person. We have uh, uh, boxes at both entrances. As you leave today, you can give your financial gift in that way. Uh, if you're more technologically inclined, you can head to uh, our website, fpclakeland.org. There's a little giving tab. You can follow the prompts there. You can text the word, one word, give FPC to 50155. And again, follow the prompts. You can scan the QR code. Um, or if you're not technologically inclined, but you're not ready to put a gift in this morning, uh, you can mail your check-in to here to the, to, to the, to the church office. Um, whatever way you give, just know that God is going to use that for his glory, for his honor, to expand his kingdom, to make and mature disciples for Jesus Christ. And we encourage you to be part of that journey with us. Let's pray for our offering uh, this morning. Gracious God, we are so grateful that we get the chance to join our voices with the voice of all creation, that we can praise you, Lord God. We can praise you, the, the creator of all the universe. We can praise you with our voices, with our songs, with our prayers. We can praise you with our financial gifts and offerings, with our time and our talent. We can praise you in all of those different ways, and you've given us that gift. And so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, use what we uh, give back to you to further your kingdom, to do your work in a, in a real and powerful way. Lord, where there's any kind of anxiety or angst about that, Help us to be open-handed with our generosity. Help us to be faith-filled people, knowing that you are going to, to, to do great things in our congregation as we partner together to that end in your name. 
Help us to be able to see with joy all that you're doing and to be able to to praise you, not just here on Sunday morning, but every day of the week. Lord, we give you that praise. We give you that glory. We give you that honor. In Christ's name, amen. You know, one of the the great things that we uh, get to do here is partner with our student ministry. Uh, You got to hear from Josh Schweitzer in our our Youth Sunday last Sunday, uh, Bring the Word of God. But he's been partnering with these students uh, during our confirmation season. And I'm going to let him kind of tell you a little bit more about that and introduce uh, these students um, uh, to you and and give you the opportunity to get to know them. Josh. Thank you, Pastor Zach. Um, Yeah, so this is our 2024 uh, class of confirmands. And I'll kind of give you a brief overview if you don't know uh, how we do confirmation or even what confirmation is. But uh, right around the eighth grade year, Uh, We invite students who uh, in the Presbyterian circle have been baptized at a younger age who have um, are making the decision uh, to make their faith their own. And so uh, for the past uh, eight or nine weeks, we've been going over the big picture of who God is, uh, what it means to be in his kingdom, um, our responsibility, not just as members of the local church, but our responsibilities as as believers in our community as well. And so this morning, uh, we got to celebrate them with their families, uh, as well as the elders. They got to have the confirmation and grill them. And every single year, I make our confirmation (laughs) think that uh, it's going to be super intense uh, with all these questions that they never get asked every time. So they're like sweating, and they're like, (sighs) okay, how do you spell Trinity? You know, um, and then confirmation is really, do you believe Jesus Christ is uh, your Savior? And kind of those great questions. So uh, in no particular order, I will uh, announce the names. It's uh, Adelaide Cruz, Elizabeth Bosetti, Alex Attaway, Avery Best, Audrey Hayde, Evelyn Rada, Garrett Blitch. Let's give a big hand to our confirmands. <laughs> And now we actually get them, have the, give them the opportunity to profess their faith to you and uh, by asking them a series of very, very easy questions. I noticed they started to sweat as soon as I said that. And they're like, wait, what? Wait, what? So you spell Trinity with a T. No, I'm just playing. Um, we, we are so excited uh, to be able to celebrate this moment where you desire to declare your faith and to share with us in our common ministry. You were in your baptism joined to Christ and made members of the church. You were joined in the community of the people of God and you have learned of God's purpose for you and for all of creation. You've been nurtured at the table of our Lord and called to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we listen together these words of scripture from Matthew chapter five, where Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel, but on the lampstand and gives it light, and it gives light to the entire house. So in the same way, you are called to now let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. So now as you publicly declare your faith in Jesus Christ and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which you were baptized, I'm going to ask you these questions. Very simple answers. Do you turn away from sin and toward a life following Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, you may answer, I do. This is where you talk, okay? If so, you may answer, I do. (laughs) All right. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, you may answer, I will. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation and share in its worship and ministry through your prayers, your gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, you may answer, I will. will. All right, let's pray. Bob reaffirmed his faith in front of everybody as well, too. That's great. (laughs) Let's pray together. Lord God, we uh, thank you so much um, for uh, these confirmands. Um, as they have publicly declared their faith before the elders of this church and before the congregation, we ask that they may continue to be yours forever. 
that you would daily increase your Holy Spirit in them more and more. Let them be active in the life and the ministry of this congregation as we all together seek to grow as your disciples. Encourage them to explore their faith with a passion to ask good and, 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 and probing questions and to search for thoughtful and true answers. Help them to be dependent upon you and your church until they come into your everlasting kingdom. Lord, we pray for your spirit to surround and fill up their families, that the word of God may be read together, that the practice of serving in the name of Jesus may be regular and, and consistent, that the worship of Jesus Christ may be of utmost importance. We pray, Lord, for uh, our youth ministry as they partner with these families, that they would do their work with great energy, creativity, and gladness, and that we as a congregation affirm our commitment to pray for and to encourage these students and their family in their faith journey. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's welcome these confirmands as members of this church. Amen. What a blessing. Amen. What a blessing to see them committing their lives to the Lord in a time when it's really hard at that age to do so. That is a blessing. And you know what? We get to demonstrate what that looks like throughout our life to them every day, if you get to have one of them in your, in your house or in your classroom, but also every week at church when we gather together as the body of Christ. And they get to see how even though we're carrying heavy burdens and pain and struggling, that we have the joy of the Lord, that we rely on our Savior. Amen. So let's stand up together. Let's be reminded of that as a family and demonstrate to them what that is all about as we sing. And 
those words every over every situation we're going through in our pain you are sufficient for today in our suffering you are sufficient for today in our financial struggles in our health struggles you are sufficient for today and father every burden that we bear as we stand in this moment we lay at your feet because we know you are good and in the joy and in the sorrow we find you just the same you are the peace we can't explain. Father, we ask your spirit be on Pastor Zach this morning as we learn more about that, about running to you, relying on you as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for that. It is great to uh, be able to celebrate the confirmation this morning and, and uh, you know, seeing uh, some of those those eighth graders, um, you know, Garrett, who's like six foot eight now, was in the three-year-old class with my son, and uh, and and it it just it boggles my mind, right? I mean that that's what happens. Kids grow up, and uh, the thing that is is amazing about kids is they they find the best way to ask the most awkward questions. And sometimes, as adults, we don't want to answer the awkward questions. And we definitely don't want to answer the awkward question for somebody else's child. Amen? Right? I remember in our last church, uh, we, Jules was pregnant with Caleb. It was our first child. And, um, and, uh, and we had known a lot of the kids for years and years and years. I'd been there a long time. And, and one of the little girls, as, as people started to say, oh, you know, Pastor Zach's wife, Julie, she's going to have a baby. And, and one of the little girls named Caroline came up to, to, to Jules and said, um, and I was happened to be standing there, where, where did it come from? She's like five years old. I'm not, I'm not answering that question. So, so what do you say to that? You say, go ask your mother, right? I mean, that's like the very first thing. And so the next week, Caroline comes up to, to, to Julie and me, and she said, oh, my mama told me where babies come from. And we're like, great, you keep it to yourself. Um, no, but she said, no, 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 it's going to come from your belly. For a five-year-old, right on, excellent. And Caroline got this really concerned look on her face. 
and she looks right at Julie like, when did you eat him? <laughs> you thought the where do babies come from question was awkward. That's even worse, right? And so we did what, you know, good people do. Go ask your mother. That's what we said. We do our best to avoid those kinds of like awkward questions. And, and unfortunately, uh, the Bible presents us with a lot of awkward questions when we read various stories. And, and as, a, as a pastor for over 25 years, I've gotten a lot of awkward questions. I actually start to look forward to some of the awkward questions. Um, questions about like predestination and election and the signs of the end of the world. Where actually in my, in my Agape Bible study class I teach on Sundays uh, before, before service, we're actually going into uh, the end of the world kind of conversations. And so there's a lot of questions that are kind of weird and, and, and awkward and uncomfortable. But I think of all the stories that we read in the Bible that present some of the most difficult and challenging questions, the, the story of Job probably presents some of the most hard-hitting, difficult questions because there are questions that we all ask. If you don't know the story of Job, Job, uh, the story of Job is told to us in the book that bears his name. It's Job. And, and what we learn about Job at the very beginning is that he is a really good guy. He's a good guy. This is what it says. This is how it describes him. At the, the very first verse in Job chapter 1, verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. I, I wish that that's, I, I just pray that that's how people would describe me, that he's an upright person. Not a perfect person. Sometimes people read that and they go, well, Job was like perfect. No, no, no. It's not that Job was perfect. It's just that he sought after God. He sought after God as, as, as diligently and passionately as he could. He worshiped regularly. He made sacrifices for himself. He made sacrifices for his family. If you continue to read in, in Job chapter 1, you see that not only was he righteous and blameless, he was also really wealthy. It describes the, the hundreds of heads of cattle and, and the large property that he had and all of the servants that he had. And he, he has all of this incredible wealth and he's a good guy. And in one day, it all changes. In one day, it all changes. Starting with verse 13, it says that in one day, his property and his servants were attacked by not one, but two armies. In the exact same day, fire falls from the sky, burning up another portion of his property. On the same day, or tornado, a great wind rips through a party that his children are having and everybody dies. In one day. As if that weren't enough, a few days later, his health goes south. He contracts a, an illness, a disease that leaves him with sores and boils all over his body. And he only has one uh, comfort is that he can take a piece of broken pottery and scrape his skin. He's having a bad week. His friends show up. A few days later, after hearing everything that he is going through, and for the only time in the whole book of Job, they do the right thing. They sit in silence just with him. As he's struggling, as he's hurting, as he's grieving, all they do is just sit with him. And then Job opens up his mouth. And when Job opens up his mouth, he complains about the day of his birth. He curses the day of his birth. He says, it's better if I had never been born. And then the three friends who think of themselves as really theologically attuned, they can't take that. And they look at Job and say, Job, you want to know why this is happening to you? You want to know why all this has taken place? It's because you're a bad person. You must have done something terrible to tick God off that he would take all of your property, he would take your family and take your health. You must have done something dreadful. 
the oldest of the friends, says this in Job chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. He says, remember who that was innocent ever perished? Or, Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. He says, look, you did bad things. Obviously, you're a sinner, and and so bad things happen. But we know, Job 1, verse 1, he's not. And Job knows that, and he has this back and forth. The bulk of the book of Job is the back and forth between the friends who say, Job, just repent. Just admit that you are a terrible person. And Job's saying, I can't. I'm not a terrible person. I haven't done anything to deserve this. And the question that keeps popping up in various forms throughout Job's speech is a question that we have probably asked ourselves. Why me? God. Why me, God? The friends think they have an answer, but Job knows that's not the right answer. And all he, all he can ask, why me, God? Job and his friends don't know why. They think they know. The friends think they know why. Job definitely doesn't know why, and he's asking. But, but here's the crazy part about the book of Job and the story of Job. We, the readers... We do know why Job is going through what he's going through. We're actually given a glimpse into the heavenly realm of God in Job chapter 1. One of the weirdest scenes in the whole Bible. This is what it says. Job chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered and said, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on earth, a a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? For no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Someone who had gone to the 815 service and Pastor John's preaching on the same passage, they they asked me in the Bible study, like, who wrote the book of Job? Like that they would know, that they would have this, this, this intimate look at this scene in the throne room of God. And, and the fact is we don't know who wrote the book of Job. Some people think it was Moses. Um, the Bible does affirm that Job was a real person. Ezekiel chapter 14, James chapter 5, they talk about Job. He was a real person. He lived a certain length of time on this earth. Uh, A lot of scholars believe that Job actually lived roughly around the time of Abraham. Before Israel was a thing, Job was there because there was no Israel. He wasn't an Israelite. He's from the land of, of, of us. But God knows Job. God knows who Job is. And what's scary is Satan does too. Now, a lot of times we, we use the word Satan like a, like a proper name. Like if you were to see Satan walking down the road, you'd be like, I got to get out of here. That's Satan. You don't want to like mess with Satan, right? But Satan is not a proper name. Satan is actually a title. The word Satan actually means adversary. And what we're seeing in the throne room of God is not just God chilling and hanging out and angels kind of flying around. And what we're actually seeing is like a courtroom drama and Satan is showing up as the prosecuting attorney. Satan is showing up to to push back against how God is running the universe, questioning how God is running the, the planet, how God is running the cosmos. And he has a pretty blunt accusation to make against God. God, nobody likes you unless you give them stuff. 
Unless you give them every desire of their heart, they don't love you. They don't worship you because, because they actually think you're worthy of worship. They don't worship you because you are the creator of the cosmos. They don't worship. They worship you because you give them what they want. And, and Job is the prime example. That's Satan's accusation. I, I call this accusation the Veruca Salt accusation. You guys know Veruca Salt? You guys know Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, right? Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Everybody's like, Zach, you took a hard left-hand turn from Job to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But I, 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 I kid you not, when I read this, I think of Veruca Salt. You know Veruca Salt. Veruca Salt is the bratty kid in, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Willy Wonka is has put out the contest. If you find the golden tickets, you get to come to his factory, get a lifetime supply of chocolate. And Veruca Salt has a very wealthy father who is in peanut shelling or something like that. And, 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 and she is like, I need to have a golden ticket. And so he puts his business on hold for who knows how many days and weeks to shuck uh, 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 you know, candy wrappers to find the golden ticket. She finds the golden ticket. And, and for a very brief moment, a very tiny window she loves her dad but every time her dad says even a slightest bit of no she flips out you're a terrible father you're awful i hate you this is the accusation that satan is making to god god everybody on the planet's veruca salt nobody loves you god unless you give them exactly what they want. And Job, he says, is the prime example. Does Job love you for nothing? You've given him everything. You've given him property. You've given him a family. You've given him everything he could possibly want. If you take it from him, he will hate you. He will curse you to your face. And the crazy part about the why of Job's suffering Job is not suffering because he's done bad things. Job's suffering actually came because of his integrity. God actually says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And this kicks off the chain of events. And you'd be like, well, Zach, that is incredibly unfair. That is so uncool of God to do that. But suffering comes to everybody. Everybody suffers sometimes. Everybody has moments where they are in Job's position in more or less ways. But the question that drives the story of Job is not, why do bad things happen to good people? A lot of times people look at Job and say, oh, this, this is a story about why bad things happen to good people. That is not what drives this story. That's not the question that drives the story. The question that drives this story is, what will godly people do when bad things happen? Because bad things are going to happen. To everybody. Good people, bad people, the, the Bible says the sun rises and sets on the wicked and the righteous the same. The, the rain falls on the wicked and the righteous the same. The question that drives the book of Job is what will godly people do when bad things happen to them? Job's friends have this, this theology, we call it retribution theology. Retribution theology is the idea that you do good things and good things will happen. You do bad things, bad things will happen. Uh, from an Eastern standpoint, we call that karma. And sometimes, sometimes that's true. Sometimes we make poor decisions and bad things will happen. Uh, last year, my cat, Skywalker, made a poor decision. He knew better because we've yelled at him many times, not to run out the front door. He ran out the front door just as I was closing the front door. And his tail got caught in the door. And he ran out the door with his tail left inside. Not the whole thing. Just three inches. And, and, and he went outside, and we opened the door, and there he is with the little bloody tail. 
why did that bad thing happen to him? Because he made a bad decision. And because I wasn't looking. So I made a bad decision too. Sometimes bad things happen because we make bad decisions. You cheat on your taxes and you get caught. T- tomorrow's tax day, just for, this is a free one, okay? Did you guys know this? I did my taxes yesterday, so I'm just, but you cheat on your taxes and the IRS catches you and they hit you with a hefty fine and you do it bad enough and they throw you in prison, guess what? That's not just like, why me, God? God's like, you made a bad decision. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes we make bad decisions and bad things happen and sometimes we make good decisions and good things happen. But it's not always like that. There's, there's, a, there's a passage of Scripture in John uh, chapter 9 where, uh, and this is not going to be on your screen because they didn't know what was going to happen. Um, John chapter 9, Jesus is, is walking with his disciples and his disciples see a man who has been born blind. And they ask the question that, that Job's friends would ask. Jesus, who sinned that this man was born blind? Who sinned? Was it him or was it his parents? They just assumed that the man was born blind because somebody had sinned so egregiously that God was punishing them. And Jesus is like, that's not how this is working. This man was not born blind because anybody sinned. It wasn't because he sinned less. But the man was born blind, Jesus said, that the power and the works of God might be displayed through him. And then Jesus heals him. And sets off a controversy, all because the man was born blind. Some people will look at this passage and go, that's just, I, what? You know, after Job has lost everything, his wife comes to him and says, are you going to hold on to your integrity after you've lost all of this? Curse God and die. That's what she says. Curse God and die. The question that drives this whole story is not why do bad things happen to good people, but what will good godly people do when bad things happen? Job's wife, her advice was curse God and die. And and it comes from a a place of, of compassion for Job. But she's wrong. She's absolutely wrong. But that's the temptation. The temptation is to believe that because because there is a God, that God must be somehow mean or, or somehow vile for suffering to take place. And so our response should be to either A, not believe there is a God, or to believe God is a bad God. This is what drives the, the song Imagine by, by John Lennon and Yoko Ono. You know the song? Imagine. Yeah, Bob knows it. He could probably play it for you right now. It's a fine, lilty song with very okay melodies, right? And I know it's like this big classic, but it's the worst theology ever. Because the idea that that John and Yoko try to put forward as part of this is, hey, let's take God out of the equation. Imagine there's no heaven. Let's take all organized religion out of the equation and no religion too. Imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's no religion too. And the, 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 the conclusion that they draw is if we take God out of the equation, then all we will be left with is peace and harmony. Really? Do you really, do we really, are we so dumb to think that the default for human beings is peace and harmony and God messes things up? Are we so dumb to believe that, that the default of, of the human experience is just joy and happiness and su- sunshine and that God and religion messes things up? That's what Job's wife would say. Curse God and die. Imagine there's no heaven. But it's garbage. It is garbage. Apart from God... Suffering still exists apart from God. Pain and loss still exist apart from God. It all still falls apart, but apart from God, the experience of suffering and pain is also senseless and purposeless and without redemption and without hope. 
One of the most frustrating things about the book of Job, for me at least when I read it, is that Job never gets an answer. Why me, God? He asks a ton in various ways, from states of great depression even to state of of feeling basically okay, but he still asks, why me, God? He never gets the answer that we, we get. God never says to Job, Job, uh, this is what happened. So um, we were in the throne room and Satan comes in and you know how Satan is. Um, He's always kind of trying to question me. And I just knew that that you you were going to hold on to your integrity. You were going to hold on to me. He doesn't get that. What he does get is a big helping of God's power and sovereignty. This This is how God responds to Job. In Job chapter 40, God says, will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. And he knows he can't do it. He has all these questions for God. Job has all these questions. Satan has all these questions for for, for God. But, 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 God's response is, you don't know what I know. You've never seen the storehouses filled with rain and snow. You don't understand how complex the universe is, the facts of sin and forgiveness and justice and truth. They're too complicated for you, Job. They're too complicated for us. God never answers Job, but here's the great news. We live on the other side of the cross, and we get an answer. In Jesus Christ, we have the answer for all sin and suffering and shame. Because see, in Jesus, God does not just let suffering just continue to run rampant. In Jesus Christ, God takes the suffering on himself. He puts it on his shoulders. That's, we, we just finished up a couple weeks ago, Holy Week. That's what Holy Week was all about. From, from, from Palm Sunday to Maundy Thursday to Good Friday, where Jesus suffers and dies, where he's rejected, where he's humiliated. He takes it all on his shoulders. And, and, and by the way, where Job might be described as blameless and upright, Jesus is more. Jesus is more holy. He absolutely does not deserve the suffering that he endures, but he endures it so that one day all suffering is defeated. One day all suffering will be defeated. The early church leader, Paul, puts it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, for our sake, God, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It wasn't Job's sin that caused him suffering, but he lived in a broken and fallen world. He lived in a world where there's still an adversary, someone questioning the very goodness of God, and that caused the suffering. But God takes the suffering on himself in Jesus. One of the commentators I, I read when, when looking at, at the book of Job, this guy named F.I. Anderson, he had this to say. He says, that the Lord himself has embraced and absorbed the undeserved consequences of evil is the final answer of Job. And all the Job's of humanity. Jesus is the final answer of every single moment where we feel like Job. Every single moment where we feel like our finances are in a Job-like condition. Every single moment where our health and our, our relationships and, and, and it, we feel like we're in this Job-like position and we want to cry out, why me, God? And, and God continues to point back to Jesus to say, I have taken care of it ultimately. I have given you a, a, a hope and a future where that does not have the final word. And so we can follow God. 
with great encouragement, with great hope and great victory because we know that the suffering that we endure right here and right now, as, as tough as it might be, it does not have the final word and it reframes our suffering so that following God can lead to a vocation of suffering. Now, I didn't invent that phrase, vocation of suffering. I came across that phrase reading a book by R.C. Sproul called Surprised by Suffering. And in it, he asked the question, what would Job's story be? What would it be if he didn't lose everything? It would be the story of a rich guy with some party-crazy kids who likes to go to church. Okay, great. Sounds like an American politician. It's not eternal. There's no redemption there. There's nothing compelling about that story. There's nothing in that story that, that, that calls us into it. It's just a rich guy. It's just a rich guy with some party crazy kids and he likes to go to church. That's awesome. That's great. I can't do anything with that. But because of his suffering, it offers Job an opportunity to make the story something more. It offers God the opportunity to do something incredible in Job's life where in the darkest of his valleys, he's able to hold on in faith to God. What makes our suffering a vocation is the ability to, to, to fall on our knees before God and have his Holy Spirit point us back to Jesus who took all his suffering on his shoulders. And, and so we can use our suffering for something greater and more eternal. Paul writes these words in Romans chapter 8. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword as it's written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul experienced all of that, threats of death, threats of persecution, thrown in prison. The people he's writing to, they face that all day long. And he's like, what, what are we supposed to do with this? Are we supposed to let this drag us down? Are we supposed to let this question God's love for us? And he says, no, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors more than conquerors through him because of Jesus and his love for us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not tornadoes, not fire from heaven, not, not bankruptcy, not losing a job, not losing a family member. As painful as those things are, we are more than conquerors because Jesus has taken it all on his shoulders. We may not get the specific answer to our Job moments, to our financial Job moments, or our physical, medical Job moments, or our relational Job moments. We may not get an answer, but because of what Jesus has done, we have the final word already given to us, and that word is victory, so that we can face what we face with a sense of assurance and calm. And here's what's even better. When we, when we are in relationships with other people who are walking through those Job moments, we are not like the friends. We're not like the friends who have to have all the answers and the pithy one-liners and the pithy cliches. We could just be with them. We could just sit with them because we understand and reframe our pain and suffering in light of the cross. We can do that for other people as well. Not to have all the answers, but just to show up with a meal in the name of Jesus. To be a, a ride to chemotherapy in the name of Jesus. To offer that kind word or that note of encouragement. To be able to help people bridge the gap financially if we have the ability to do so in the name of Jesus. Even if we're not in a great financial strong state ourselves, we say, hey, I know in the name of Jesus that this, this, this 
downward spiral that I'm feeling is not the final word. This battle loss that I feel, it's not the final victory. Jesus has that victory. The calling of our God, the vocation of our suffering is to look at the pain in this life as training to help others see Jesus in the middle of their pain. The alternative is the calling of the atheist. Pain still comes. Suffering still comes. Curse God and die. No hope, no meaning, no redemption, no purpose at all. But because Jesus has suffered, because he's taken our suffering, there is more. There is a vocation. There is a calling. There is an eternity. An eternity that ignores that atheist call, that cultural call to say it all doesn't make sense. And so it must be purposeless. But because of Jesus, we know that there is a purpose. The question is, even in the middle of our pain, what will we do to answer God's call? Will you join me in prayer? Gracious and holy God, you know what we face. You know the the heartache, you know the hurt, you know the the pain, you know the the unanswered questions that, that... drive us insane. Lord, right now, you know the people in this room and you know the Job moments that that they're facing. And they're real. And you, you actually care about them. And so, Lord, I pray that you would do something miraculous. Maybe take care of the problem, but but in the middle of the the heartache to provide that peace to to provide that assurance to provide that perspective that looks to the cross that looks to the empty tomb to know that the suffering doesn't have the last word that because of the resurrection death doesn't have the last word because of the empty tomb even our our decaying bodies don't have the last word, that there is something more. And let that perspective motivate us to reach out to others in the middle of their pain, in the middle of their Job moments, not to try to have all the answers except one, Jesus Christ, to provide that compassion and that comfort Lord, move in and through us with your Holy Spirit to be your people, reflections of your goodness to the world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Right now, uh, we're excited to celebrate the sacrament of baptism. So I'm going to call forward uh, Sage Cross and the Hayde family as we prepare. Come on up to celebrate this sacrament. Sage is uh, a wonderful girl, 10 years old, and she's not afraid to ask awkward questions, let me tell you. But that's what makes her great. And I got to meet with uh, Sage last year in, in the fall and, and, and ask her some really important questions about her faith and her belief. And that's why she's here. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. In the book of Acts, Peter preaches the very first sermon of the church and he says to the the congregation who's gathered at the steps of, of the temple, repent and believe and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself was baptized and calls his followers to be baptized as well. He calls the church to go into all the world baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching those who are baptized to obey everything that he has commanded them. 
And so today, in obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident in his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. For in baptism, God claims us. He seals us as his own, uniting us with his son, Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection. And this is an awesome, awesome gift. We cannot put God under conviction as though he owes us our salvation. But he gives us that salvation because he loves us. Baptism is properly administered in the presence of the church. You, Christ's body, so that you can partner with Sage in in her faith journey. It represents our being united with Christ and with one another. Let's remember our baptism as we celebrate this moment. Will you pray with me? God, we give thanks that you nourish and sustain all things. And you do so by the gift of water. In the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed the evil of the world by the water of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. You led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea and into the freedom of the promised land. Through the waters of the Jordan River, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, Jesus Christ set us free from sin and death, opening the way for all of us to enter into eternal life. God, we thank you for the water of baptism, for all the promises it signifies, for the union we share with Jesus Christ. So now send forth your Holy Spirit to move over this water that it might be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all those who are cleansed by it and raise them to new life and graft them into the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Sage that she might have power to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. We give you praise, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now Jason will present Sage to you for holy baptism. On behalf of the session of the First Presbyterian Church, Lakeland, Florida, I present Sage Cross for the Sacrament of Holy Baptism. Do we, the members of this congregation, commit to support and encourage her and her family as they grow in their faith in Jesus Christ? And do we promise to pray for them as they live out their commitment to God? If so, we may answer, we do. All right, Sage, step on forward here, hon got a couple questions for you. Three, actually. Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you trust him? Yes. <laughs> will you seek to be his faithful disciple? You will. All right, Sage, come on over here. Based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you so much for Sage, for her profession of faith and the witness that she brings before our entire congregation. Help her to affirm her vows today and live into those vows the rest of her life and help us as the congregation to lift her up in prayer and in words of encouragement, her and her family, that she might grow in her knowledge and faith of you. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's welcome Sage into the body of Christ. We continue uh, to celebrate the sacrament of baptism with Audrey Hayde, who was just confirmed, but it was confirmed contingent upon her baptism. And so we understand that this is a moment where she once again acknowledges her faith in Jesus Christ. And the, the, the symbol of this water is so important. It represents several things the washing of our sins, the death and resurrection of Jesus, and the giving of the Holy Spirit to us. Christians are baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we remember our communion with God and with one another. By the water and by the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us pray together. Lord God, we thank you once again for this sacrament. 
that it seals us in our relationship to you. That by your spirit moving in and through this water and this moment, Audrey might feel her connection to you in a more deep and profound way. That she might find her connection to this community more powerful and strong. Lord, once again, by your Holy Spirit, use this moment to be for Audrey, for her family, a time of great celebration and growth and strength. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Jason? On behalf of the session of the First Presbyterian Church, Lakeland, Florida, I present Audrey Hade for the sacrament of holy baptism. Do we, the members of the congregation, commit to support and encourage her and her family as they grow in their faith in Jesus Christ? And do we promise to pray for them as they live out their commitment to God? If so, we may answer, we do. Audrey, we've got a couple questions for you. You've already answered some of these questions just a little bit ago. But who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust Him? Will you seek to be His faithful disciple? Based on your profession of faith, Audrey, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, once again, we thank you so much for Audrey, for her family, for their commitment to you and this church, for Audrey's commitment to express her faith in Jesus before us all. Lord, we ask that you would help her grow by the power of your spirit and the truth of your word, that she might be your more faithful disciple. In Jesus' name, amen. Audrey, thank you so much. Last but certainly not least is Joseph Hay. Joseph, we're glad that you're here. Joseph is part of the Hayde family, so we've already prayed for the Hayde family, but we're going to do so again for Joseph's sake. So as he uh, affirms his faith in Jesus Christ before all of us, uh, we can know uh, that we are surrounding them with their, with our prayers and with our encouragement. You know, this moment of acknowledging Jesus Christ before others is so significant where Jesus says, if you acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But the reverse is also true. Those who deny me before others, Jesus says, I will deny before my Father in heaven. That's why this public, not private, this public profession of faith is so significant in our sacrament of baptism. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for Joseph for the motivation to say, yes, I believe in Jesus. Lord, let this be a declaration, not just with his words, but with his entire life. Let the declaration that I believe in Jesus motivate everything he says, thinks, feels, and does to your glory and honor. And Lord, help us, those who proclaim faith in Jesus, to do the same. That this is not an academic or intellectual pursuit, but a pursuit that, that affects every part of our lives. Holy Spirit, seal Joseph in this moment of baptism to you, that he might grow in his faith and knowledge. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jason. On behalf of the session of the First Presbyterian Church of Lakeland, Florida, I present Joseph Hayde for the sacrament of holy baptism. Do we, the members of this congregation, commit to support and encourage him and his family as they grow in their faith in Jesus Christ? And do we promise to pray for them as they live out their commitment to God? If so, we may answer, we do. Joseph, I'll ask you, who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust him? Will you seek to be his faithful disciple? Joseph, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Spirit. Amen. Thanks for bending down a little bit so I could reach your head better. <laughs> Let's pray once again. Gracious God, as we have baptized Joseph, Audrey, and Sage, help us to remember how much you love us, that you have suffered and died for our sins and resurrected to new life so that we might have hope in a future, power over the suffering in this world. 
move in and through us, that as a community, we would surround each of those who have received baptism today, and we would surround one another with our encouragement and our prayers. We pray this in the strong and powerful name of Jesus, who has brought us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. You guys didn't see this, but there are about 10 or 12 precious faces up here in the window during that first baptism. Um, clapping and cheering her on. I think that is just precious, and that's a testament to our community here and the community you've created with one another, loving and supporting and uplifting one another. So before we leave today, let's stand with one voice, and let's sing out to our Heavenly Father together.
true and our hope is that as we have had so many people declare publicly their faith in Jesus Christ that you would go out of this place ready to live out your faith in Jesus Christ in a powerful, powerful way. We, we want to be on that journey with you. Like I said earlier, if you're new, we've got a welcome table in the back. The Boltons are back there. They've got a gift for you. And then a 10-minute party where you can meet some of our leaders and just get to ask questions about how they can, how you can be a part of FPC and we can be on that faith journey together. Also want to let you know about two other things. One is VBS is coming up. It's coming up June 17th to 21st. Uh, check out our website to register or to volunteer. And we're excited about a worship night that is happening on Wednesday, April 24th. We've never done anything like this before, but that Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. right here, uh, Jennifer Voigt and our praise band is joining together with uh, students at Southeastern University to do a night of, of song and prayer and worship and praise that is Wednesday, April 24th at 6.30. Mark your calendars. It's a free event. It's going to be a powerful, powerful evening. So make sure that you uh, show up for that. It's going to be a great, great time. Let's pray as we close out. Gracious God, we, we pray that our light, our lives will be built on the firm foundation of Jesus so that when the, the suffering and the pain and the disappointment comes and we feel like we're being tossed around we have something strong to hold on to the goodness the beauty the truth of jesus christ who's taken all the suffering on his own shoulders help us to hold on to that and be a witness to others who need to hear and feel the same we pray this in jesus name amen we'll see you guys next sunday